This is Morty. He begins his day the best way he knows how. A jog from 5.30 to 6 a.m. followed by an intense workout. After Morty's usual morning jog, he stops by his dealer's place to pick up his usual supply. Morty's the captain of the school team, the number one shot stopper who saved them one too many times. Because of this, he's pretty much royalty in school. One thing people didn't know was that Morty's life was nowhere near as rich or as glamorous as he made it seem, which meant he couldn't pay off his expensive lifestyle most of the time. At lunch, Morty would sit with his teammates, their girlfriends, and whatever lucky girl he chose to spend his time with that day. Every day, a different girl tries to profess their love, and every day he turns them down. Today was no different. But he doesn't do that because he's an asshole. It's because he's in love with someone else. After school's out, Woody makes his way to the football pitch, where he has his games. But first he has to meet up with the girl he loves in secret. After the game, Woody decided to jog back to his hole, but doesn't make it there. Them say see danger, you know they see danger. No go lose your center, all because of paper. Them say see danger, you know they see danger. No go lose your center. Someone you want know is dead. And one of you did it. One of you killed Morty. This is Samuel. Sam for short. Sam is known as the class brainiac. Sam is an introvert and spends most of his time alone and is more concerned about making an important impact in the world. Sam's idea of having fun is sitting down in the library all day, reading and listening to his favorite musician, Ed Sheeran. Now, let's move to James. James, the typical bad boy. James has a very peculiar look that almost makes him seem as charming as he thinks he is. He wears a long leather jacket that he feels makes him look cool. James has his way with his teachers and the girls. It's pretty smooth. James is quite artistic and spends most of his days drawing things based on his feelings at that moment and feels better expressing himself in form of art. Let's talk about the high school sweethearts, Mike and Daisy. Mike and Daisy are typical relationship goals. They eat together, they post everything they do together on the snaps, and have been fond of rubbing their perfect relationship, so to say, in people's faces. Okay, let's move to Stacy. This is Stacy. Stacy loves to be around a popular group of friends and walk around the school like they own it. Stacy's idea of the world? It's hers. She gets everything she wants from her father, being the town's biggest business tycoon and all. Everything she wants but one thing. Okay, let's skip to John. John the Roach. John is a survivor. A survivor who has never had anything handed to him. He worked for everything he's got. From a very young age, he understood the fact that life was full of disappointment. And in order to get something worth anything, one had to make some sacrifices. Abandoned by his parents at a young age, John took odd jobs and worked at odd hours just to make sure his siblings didn't have to go through everything that he went through. 
Or did I mention that Jim was a straight A student? Well, he is. It comes pretty easy to him. Jim's on a scholarship from the state. However, he doesn't believe an education can give him the life he wants. He believes that's what drove his mother away. So we've met the suspects. Now, let's hear the rest of the stories. Let me start from the top. Sam is an introvert that spends most of his time alone. And when he's alone, he's doing something mischievous. Sam is doing drugs. And not just any type of drugs. Sam does his own in a special blend, which he gets from suppliers, which he mixes and sells to others. Something as delicate as mixing drugs, of course, requires some expertise. And that expertise comes at an expensive price. Behind the whole good guy facade, Sam is a crook that's never been caught. Well, for one, James is an emotional mess who's been in and out of school his whole life. James is an alcoholic and a rumored drug addict. His inability to think through things without feeling depressed made him resort to alcohol. James is quite influential in school, so whatever James does, others follow. You know how it goes. Monkey see, monkey do. For the couple. As individuals, honestly, they have a better identity together than they have alone. Mike, for one, has no idea what he wants to do with his future and has been involved in countless thefts in school. Which he keeps getting away with. How? Two words. Principal dad. Yeah. Mike's dad is the principal of the school and getting expelled would be bad for publicity for him. Daisy, on the other hand, is also quite unsure what she wants. She likes to believe that she's trapped in a world where her decisions are often made for her. Like the decision to date Mike in the first place, being made for her by her friends. Her entire identity now revolves around her relationship with Mike, who can be very controlling and impulsive. Being very attractive, Daisy has a lot of guys in school dying to be with her. Or in this case, should I say, dead. As rich and unapproachable as Stacy seems, a few boys did try to shoot the shot, but they weren't the ones she wanted. She wanted another and was willing to do anything to get it. In school, John tries to keep a very low profile because he's the biggest supplier in the community and needs no unnecessary attention. John was the kingpin of his school's drug trade, from the students to the dirty, dirty staffs. Now, for the day of the murder. On this day, Sam tried a new mix he thought would be great, but he definitely wouldn't test it on himself. So instead, he let his usual money and pickup do it. Unlike his other customers, this person never paid because they had dirt on Sam. Dirt that Sam would do anything to get rid of. To fund his drug and alcohol problem, he takes money from a guy in exchange for attending his classes. On this day, however, James hadn't gotten his money, and more importantly, hadn't gotten his drugs. James ended up spending his free time painting naked pictures of the girl he loved while drinking. In the evening, he went out for a stroll, which eventually led him to the pool. On this day, like every other, the couple were at lunch together, with Mike's team along with their teammates and their girls. After lunch, they went to classes together as well, but eventually had to separate, as Daisy said, she had drama rehearsals, the only school activity she wasn't doing with Mike. The rumor going around school was that Daisy was having an affair. That's where she was really going, to meet the other man in her life, long before Mike's game started. At the end of the match and their victory, Mike overheard a conversation about the affair. And on hearing this, the only thing that came to his mind was to find the guy and to put the hurt on him. 
On this day, after several advances and subsequent shutdowns, Stacy decided to make a move on the guy she's wanted. After all, he could have been shy. But Stacy got the shock of her life when she confessed her love and got completely shut down in front of literally everyone in the cafeteria. In the hours that followed, Stacy received many offers of shoulders to cry on, all of which she ended up rejecting. Ironically, being told no for the first time in her life only made her want him more. So Stacy did what any normal girl would do in love. She went to watch his game at the school pitch that evening. Earlier that week, somebody pitched an idea to John that he could supply him with better quality drugs for a cheaper price. Till now, John believes that he must have somehow been high because he trusted that person so easily and handed over a large sum of money to the person to plug him. He even called his regular supplier and broke off all ties. Definitely high. Days after the exchange, the person failed to deliver the drugs, claiming that he had no idea of such negotiation. On his way back to the dorm that evening, he stumbled across the same person who'd misled him, going on an evening job. Mike and his friend happened to run into the very guy they were looking for, going on an evening job, equipped with baseball bats in hand. They roughed him up, dragged him back to the football pitch, where they finished him off. After they were done, Mori wasn't moving. Afraid of what they might have done, the boy dragged his body to the pool and dumped him in, scrambling and tossing the baseball bat to the best place they could find, the girls' locker room window. After the match, Stacy tried talking to Mordi again, but was already gone. Disappointed, she strolled to the pool and took a long shower, where she decided no man was worth this much trouble. Whilst in the solitude, she heard a loud splash, it was shortly by a metal can. She goes out to check and finds the body of a young man whom she recognizes drifting in the pool. James watched the serene pool for hours while the rest of the school paid attention to the game. He was so drunk he passed out next to the fence only to wake up to a scene he couldn't understand or remember. A young girl running away from the pool. There was one more witness to the crime. A character that saw the scene in the cafeteria one who had a sort of investment in the outcome, one who had a direct dealing with both parties and wanted to make sure Muddy was dead. The only one of the students could have pulled off the murder without even having laid a finger directly or indirectly on Muddy. You are what you eat. Muddy should have been more careful with the way he treated his chef. What's the point of all this, you might ask? Well. If Mordi never faked his life, he would never have been in debt and would never have owed so many people, one of which may have held a grudge towards him. If he never had an affair with his teammate's girl, he would never have gotten beat up and dragged by the pool. He also might not have rejected a certain girl who could have saved his life. We all make choices that affect our lives, directly or indirectly. Them say see danger, you know they see danger, no go lose your center, all because of PayPal. Them say see danger, you know they see danger, no go lose your center, all because of PayPal. Ah, uh, uh. because you want to live the fudgy life, you ready to pay the price, do the sacrifice. You ready to pay the price, take your mama life And even you know fit explain, this your appetite You want the bands, you don't want to take the taxi fight You want all that gold bottles and maybe 35 You want hella private jet things when you catch a flight Now you don't they share where they lost on, you don't they back for night Skeletons in your closet, you murdered to child supper All the wraps of powder you swallow to pass border All the person picking you carry for tight corner I see you when you call it a good jail girl lockba them say you talk, say you define rubber. And so you go and dip your two hands in foul matter. Oh, God, this one you they do it. Pass it.